All right. Hey there, students. Tom Ritchie here, and it's time for a little AP Euro review. All right, doing some Q&A tonight, um, and we're going to be focusing on Unit 7, Nationalism, Unifications, Imperialism, the Second Industrial Revolution, and all of that good stuff. Now, remember, I'm going live, you know, every week at eight o'clock. Make sure if you're watching on YouTube, click the link to join us on Crowdcast. That way you'll get, uh, you know, you'll get some things from me every time that I'm going to go live or when I'm going to um, advertise some bonus events and stuff like that um, closer to the exam. Because Paper Pencil, we've got some stuff coming up uh, pretty quickly. And let me go ahead and see those of you who are here in the Crowdcast, uh, when do you plan uh, do you plan to take your AP exam? Uh, so let's go ahead and say, remember early May, that is paper pencil. Um, late May, that is of course the first uh, digital exam or early June. And let's see about that. And while y'all are answering that poll here on Crowdcast, let's go ahead and also remind everybody um, that Marco Learning is offering student support in a variety of subjects. Okay, so if you go to marcolearning.com slash student dash support, I'm going to go ahead and put that up there. If you're watching on YouTube, you can find out some more information on student support by going to the uh, you know link in the description. Those of you who are here, um, let's go ahead. Those of you there, you've got a link there and it's not too late to sign up. You know, we've got some archive things and then, you know, we got that. And I believe that the coupon code is Richie 30. Now you might want to contact support at marcolearning.com. If you try to sign up and Richie 30 doesn't work, just email support at marcolearning.com and ask them like, what was that discount code uh, that Tom Richie had? Okay. But I'm pretty sure that it's Richie 30. Okay. So just don't quote me on that. But if you want to look into that and remember, you can use that Richie 30 discount code on any of these things. So let's go ahead and see what y'all are asking. And remember y'all can upvote questions as well, okay? And so going from there, um, you know, we've got a question about the revolutions of 1848. Um, one of the things that's kind of bringing to an end the whole age of Metternich, okay? So the age of Metternich um, from about 1815 to 1848, one of the things that's kind of, you know, ending the age of Metternich um, is the revolutions of 1848. Remember, the other one is the Crimean War, okay? The Crimean War is the first time after the Congress of Vienna, that the great powers are at war against each other. So, you know, the Crimean War um, show, you know, that is something that really kind of spells the end of the concert system, because remember the whole thing about the concert system was all of the great powers are working together in unison. So as far as the revolutions of 1838, okay? So, or not 38, 48, right? I should know this, right? Okay, so it looks like uh, the majority of you here are gonna be taking your exam in late May, okay? But we do have about 40% of you who are going to be taking the paper pencil exam. All right, so with that, let's go ahead and think about, now the revolutions of 1848, First of all, you know, for several years when I first taught Euro, I was like, okay, the revolutions of 1848 happened. Okay. That was kind of where I, where I went with that. Um, so going with that, uh, you know, the revolutions of 1848, of course, happened and they happened in 1848. Um, but then also we want to know some things specifically that are happening. First of all, several European nations were swept by a series of simultaneous revolutions. Second, these revolutions generally failed and conservatives regained power. Third, Britain and Russia did not experience the revolutions that otherwise swept over the continent. Now, you, what I would advise, I've got a five-part five video lecture um, on the revolutions of 1848. The first part, I just go into these generalities, okay? So we're kind of ending the age of Metternich, but also we want to focus on why the revolutions of 1848 failed. And largely because you have different groups here that are participating in this. Th these are not revolutions that are led by groups of people that share ideology ideologies and stuff like that. So there are liberals, there are nationalists. Now, liberals and nationalists can cooperate with each other. I mean, after all, when you think about liberalism, it's based on free association. People tend to freely associate with people who share things in common with them. And so 
liberals and nationalists can cooperate to a point, but when you have socialists involved as well. Now, of course, remember in the United States, uh, there are people who use the term liberal and socialist interchangeably. When we're talking about 19th century Europe, liberalism and socialism cannot be farther apart. You know, even in Europe today, um, somebody who identifies themselves as a liberal um, is thinking in terms of the individual. Okay? Okay, liberalism for purposes of AP Euro, remember this is something that is largely about individualism and economically, typically about a free market economy, low taxes, low regulation. Now, people who still identify as economic liberals today in Europe still subscribe to those principles of low taxation, low regulation, and the like. Um, now, of course, social liberals, um, they favor a bit more government involvement in the economy, but still favor individualism, um, you know, in, uh, you know, politics and society. Um, but socialists, socialists focus on the group, okay? And then, of course, you've got uh, what I would call the radical Democrats, you know, the ones who are kind of on the same page with the Chartists, who are wanting universal male suffrage without any regard to property requirements. Now, remember that liberals, uh, you know, in the 19th century were a little bit afraid of this, okay? A little bit afraid of the idea of, uh, you know, everyone voting regardless of property qualifications. Because remember that liberals are partly thinking in terms of, just like conservatives, the government should protect property. So part of the reason the revolutions of 1848 failed um, is that, you know, you can see here that these, you know, these revolutionaries, they don't have a common program. Now, the other thing is the conservatives tended to be, uh, you know, the conservatives tended to be pretty much on the same page. So you can see here, the concert system is really working quite well here to help put down these revolutions. Now, uh, you know, France, you've got kind of a semi-successful revolution, but then turns conservative. There are no armies going here, but you see here in the German states, and in Italy, okay? So basically Italy, when there's a revolution of 1848, and I've got, got a video about that, and it's actually uh, helpful if you're researching Italian unification that you've got the French coming in, you've got the Austrians coming in, you've got um, the Bourbons coming in from the Sicilies here. So you've got basically all, you know, the great powers are coming in to help the Pope. The Pope is calling for help. Then we see here where Russia, which did not experience a revolution of 1848, is now coming into, uh, you know, coming into Hungary, um, where you had this Hungarian revolt. And so, um, you know, as far as what you see, uh, what you see here now also, okay, interesting, the, you know, this is still part of the Ottoman Empire and realize there is a Romanian uh, revolt uh, in 1848 that we don't really talk about that much. But there is an Ottoman army there. You know what? I'm actually like low-key curious now. I'm just going to take a quick look over here and uh, let's see. Romanian. Romanian revolution of, okay, so there actually is a Romanian liberal and nationalist uprising, okay? Now, as far as that, uh, as far as that goes here, you've got the Romanian tricolor, which is the flag of Romania today. Now, notice the tricolor flag, this originated in France. And so France has a tricolor flag, Italy has a tricolor flag, Hungary and Romania. A lot of European states have this tricolor flag with the vertical stripes. And this is something that is going to typically, uh, you know, be something that is symbolic of republicanism. Okay. So that's something to, uh, to keep in mind there. Um, so we see here that uh, it toppled a prince, it replaced it with a provisional government, um, then passed a series of progressive, uh, progressive reforms. Um, so going, uh, going from that, let's see, what was the, uh, what was the result of this thing? Okay. The suppression. Okay. So as far as that goes, Ottoman troops. All right. So we see here that there is an Ottoman victory there. It's not a very big battle. It doesn't look like, but the Ottomans come in 
And there you see that, uh, you know, basically the Ottoman Russian occupation prolonged itself until 1851. Okay, this is interesting. Now, this is not going to be at the top of the list. Like, you're certainly not going to get like a multiple choice question about this. But, you know, I've never actually looked at that, uh, that there was a Romanian revolution of 1848. So uh, there is Romania breaking off her chains on the field of liberty. Now, it's only a short time later because at this time, the Ottoman Empire is retreating. OK, so when we think about like, you know, Romania, um, you know, when that country was actually created, um, that's going to be um, in. Let's see. That was, you know, Romania was founded. Let's see. It wasn't founded in 2011. So, uh, yeah, it was formed in 1859. OK, so it's only a short time. You know, the Ottoman Empire, they put uh, that. They are now the new state officially named Romania since 1866, gained independence from the Ottoman Empire in 1877. Now, one thing we want to note here, it's like, OK, why are we talking about the Ottoman Empire? Well, we don't necessarily really go into the interior of the Ottoman Empire in this course, but we want to note here that the Ottoman Empire, uh, you know, in the late uh, 17th century, the late 1600s, uh, the Ottomans were besieging Vienna. All right. So the Ottomans were at the gates of Vienna, Austria. And so, you know, in, you know, about the 60, uh, 1683 was the peak of the Ottoman Empire. And you can see here where where the Ottomans, uh, you know, they've got, uh, you know, whether it's directly or through vassal states, uh, they are pretty much all over the Balkan Peninsula. You know, this started with the fall of Constantinople um, in 1453. So one of the things that's going to lead to World War One, well, the Crimean War, first of all, and then World War One, is the Ottoman Empire, uh, the so-called Eastern question with the Ottoman Empire as the sick man of Europe. You know, Know, what is going to happen with this power vacuum here as the Ottoman Empire retreats? And so this is something that has a, you know, very profound destabilizing effect that this is, of course, you know, in the Balkans is where World War I is going to start. So with that, I would encourage you to take a look at my initial lecture. It's about a five minute lecture or so on the revolutions of 1848. And I would also recommend at least the one on France. Okay. The French Revolution of 1848 is worth taking a look at there. So that's kind of setting up things, you know, bringing about the end of the so called uh, Age of Metternich. And so going from there, um, when we're getting into this, let's see. So um, who are the most important people in this time period? OK, I would say that the single most important person, um, if it's, uh, you know, if it's me, I would say that, uh, you know, that would be Bismarck. Otto von Bismarck um, is, of course, uh, you know, the most important person of this time because he's the architect not only of German unification, but also the architect of the alliance system. And of course, the alliance system is one of the major, uh, you know, is one of the uh, you know, is one of the major things that's going to be leading to World War One. So I would say that Bismarck, because he is responsible for creating basically this German super state, okay, that the Congress of Vienna created, the Congress of Vienna created a German confederation with 39 states, but then you know, basically, when you have this creation, uh, you know, of the German super state by Bismarck, uh, this is something that is going to, uh, you know, that is going to be a big game changer and lead directly or indirectly, okay, directly or indirectly to the world wars. Uh, now, another person, if you're thinking about uh, someone who is involved in Italian unification, um, you know, I believe that both Garibaldi and and Cavour are mentioned in the uh, course and exam description. So it's definitely something worth noting, uh, you know, worth noting there. So the most important now, this is one of those things as well that, you know, there aren't, you know, it's like this is one of those time periods where I'm not really thinking of, you know, of it being very people heavy. Okay. But as far as that goes, uh, AP Euro. 
course and exam description 2020. Let's go ahead and just take a quick look there. Uh, you know, topic 7.2. Um, another person that, uh, well, one person now, not necessarily in this, uh, you know, at this time here, but I would mention here, you know, when we're talking about nationalism, um, we want to think of also, uh, you know, when we're looking here, let me go ahead and go into nationalism and I'll bring a couple of people up that I think are worth, uh, that are worth noting here. Okay. And so going with that, uh, you know, going with that, uh, let's go ahead and take a look here at the course and exam description. And going from there, you see here we're nationalist, encourage loyalty to the nation, a variety of ways. Okay. Um, and then we see here racialism with a co concomitant anti-Semitism and chauvinism, uh, you know, basically warlike, uh, you know, justifying national aggrandizement, some of what's going to lead to imperialism. Now, what we want to note here is the dilemma that, you know, European Jews are facing in the 19th century, okay? Because on one hand, we see here European Jews became more socially and politically acculturated, okay? And so that's something worth noting. For example, um, the Test Acts, okay? So if we look at, remember the Test Acts, these were passed, uh, you know, at the time, you know, shortly after the English Civil War, 1673, the Parliament said, you know what, uh, you know, we'll tolerate just about any religion, but if you want to have a government post, you're going to have to be an Anglican, okay? If you want to have a government post, you're going to have to be an Anglican. And so with that, you know, when we look at the Test Acts, uh, that this these were repealed in 1828, with little controversy, okay? So we note here, after 1800, they were seldom enforced, okay? Now it says here that only um, Anglicans, um, you know, in the, you know, after 1800, only Anglicans could go to Oxford and Cambridge. But other than that, uh, you know, basically 1828, um, the test acts are repealed, okay? So that is, uh, you know, that is pretty much, uh, that's pretty much over as far as you having to be an Anglican um, in order to, you know, have a prominent position in the government or the military or something like that. So we note here that official religious prohibitions are done. Now, somebody was asking something about mass politics, um, you know, Benjamin Disraeli, I think, is always somebody um, that I mention in terms of when we're talking about, you know, the acculturation of European Jews. OK, so Disraeli. Now, Benjamin Disraeli was the prime minister of the United Kingdom. OK, so he's the British prime minister. Now, note here, Benjamin Disraeli was not a religious Jew. Disraeli was actually a baptized Anglican. His father decided to renounce the Jewish religion and baptize his children, have his children baptized in the Anglican church. So while Benjamin Disraeli was not a uh, religious Jew, you know, he was religiously an Anglican, but at the same time, he was obviously an ethnic Jew. You know, his name is literally Benjamin the Israeli. Okay. And so this man was the prime minister of the United Kingdom, really at the heart of uh, you know, basically at the peak of Britain's power, uh, their prime minister is an ethnic Jew. And I think this says something about uh, the acculturation of European Jews, but at the same time, um, in the late 19th century, where on one hand, you've got Benjamin Disraeli and his rivalry in mass politics, his rival was William Gladstone. OK, so William Gladstone was the Benjamin Disraeli was the head of the, the leader of the conservative party. And so you note, notice here that he was preceded by. Um, William Gladstone. Okay, so both times, so basically there's Disraeli for a short time in 1868 and then William Gladstone. Um, and then we see here that uh, when he's back in 1874, William Gladstone, 
okay? And then William Gladstone succeeds him. So William Gladstone was the leader of the, you know, my goodness. I mean, we've got here that he is uh, there. He is prime minister four times between 1868 and 1894. Um, and so this was something, now this was a period where you start to see mass politics. Now, another thing to note here, you know, William Gladstone was really like the last of the classical liberals, okay? As far as that goes, Gladstone is still favoring classical liberal policy where on economically keeping taxes low, regulations low. Uh, then uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, socially, um, Gladstone actually, you know, had the bill pushed through to disestablish the Church of Ireland before Gladstone was prime minister. Before Gladstone was prime minister, Gladstone, like in Britain, there or in the UK, there was a basically a Church of Ireland that was an official established Protestant church that took tax money from the Irish. And so Gladstone is like, okay, we're no longer going to have, uh, you know, so, yeah, so basically the disestablishment of the Church of Ireland, okay? And so the Church of Ireland, uh, you know, was, uh, you know, an Anglican church, basically, okay? So the second largest Christian church, uh, you know, on the Ireland, uh, you know, on the island of Ireland after the Roman Catholic Church. And so as far as, uh, you know, as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, um, what we're going to uh, what we're going to see here is also the introduction of the secret ballot. Okay, so we're going to see this. Uh, you know, after uh, you know, so we see here uh, the you know the secret ballot um, is going to be introduced here. So in this era of mass politics, you've got this rivalry um, between Disraeli and Gladstone. Disraeli being a big advocate of imperialism. Okay, so Disraeli. Um, was, uh, you know, basically the one who got Queen Victoria um, as the, you know, proclaimed the Empress of India, you know, the Queen of, uh, you know, the Queen of Britain and Ireland, but the Empress of India. Now, the thing is, on one hand, uh, you know, Benjamin Disraeli represents how, uh, you know, Jews are becoming more socially and politically acculturated. But at the same time, we see with the Dreyfus Affair, okay? So the Dreyfus Affair, um, was uh, was an incident uh, in France in the 1890s. Okay, so basically, what we can see here, uh, you know, is that the Dreyfus affair. This is something I've got some slides there, but I'm not quite, uh, you know, quite ready there. But basically, Alfred Dreyfus, okay, was a French military officer. Now, like Benjamin Disraeli, Alfred Dreyfus, uh, you know, began, you know, he went to the French military academy. He began a career in the French military as an officer, and so from there, you. You know, he's of Jewish descent. Now, in France, there still, you know, was at the time a great deal of anti-Semitism. Now, Edgar Degas, now we know that Edgar Degas, who was an Impressionist artist, we know that he was an anti-Semite, a raving anti-Semite. Um, and so, you know, he was an Impressionist. Um, and so we see, uh, you know, we see with some of his work, uh, you know, where we can see, uh, you know, note you know, it's kind of like, you know, with his work, it's, you know, you it's not like a Monet, but you can still kind of tell that, okay, this is a, this is a painting, right? Um, and so still like this kind of impressionist, like the brush strokes are still, you know, kind of visible here. Um, and so, you know, this, you know, the way that impressionism often showed off like this bourgeois, you know, way of life in the late 19th century, you know, even like the woman just combing her hair, okay? And so, uh, you know, these are works by Degas. Now, Degas is even, uh, you know, actually, you know, taking a selfie in 1895. So he's kind of, you know, a pioneer of selfie photography. Now, um, Degas was a raving anti-Semite. Uh, and so there is, uh, there is speculation when you look at the portraits at the stock exchange that uh, that he is accentuate, like he's basically caricaturing Jews at the stock exchange. Now, did he ever say this? 
know, but it's just it is one of the the things that people note when they look at this uh, at this work of art. And so we see here this you know anti-Semitism in France. And so you know, and as I said, this is something I'm working on here. But basically, in 1894, Dreyfus is court-martialed. He's found guilty of treason. Has his sword you know broken there in front of him. Is sent to Devil's Island in the Caribbean. And so this uh, this turns into this huge controversy where, you know, Emile Zola, he writes this uh, this article, J'accuse, you know, I accuse. OK, so he's writing this article, I accuse. And this is in defense of Dreyfus. So you've got people who are Dreyfusards, anti-Dreyfusards. Now, Dreyfus is, you know, when they realize like, OK, we've got some evidence that he didn't sell secret. You know, he didn't give secrets to the Germans. OK. And so as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, you know, he didn't give secrets to the Germans. Uh, but at the same uh, at the same time, uh, they bring him back to trial. He's found guilty again. OK, so he's found guilty again. And so from there, finally, the third time, I think he's finally exonerated. But this started this like huge debate between uh, between French people who were, you know, identified themselves as Dreyfusards or anti Dreyfusards. And the thing is now the Dreyfus affair is not the only thing that's driving this, but Zionism. OK, when we're thinking about Zionism, um, this is a particular form of Jewish nationalism. So one of the things about Zionism that we want to note here is that this is, you know, a form. So Zionism is a form of nationalism. OK, so you have basically the advocacy of, you know, an Italian, you know, a unified Italian state, a unified German state. And this idea that people should have a state with people who share, uh, you know, they have a shared language, a shared culture, a shared religion, a shared history. Now, of course, Zionism is a bit different because a lot of Jews speak different languages in Europe at this time. And actually, uh, you know, when you go to Israel, you can hear a lot of different languages being spoken um, and you should be able to tell it doesn't take much to be able to tell the difference between Hebrew and Russian you know you can tell when somebody's speaking Hebrew you can tell when someone's speaking Russian you know in Israel today there are several languages that are spoken at one time and pretty much people tend to understand English um, as well and so with that, um, this is developing in the late 19th century in response to growing anti-Semitism. So Dreyfus is first accused in 1894. Um, Theodore Herzl here, you know, the father of Zionism, um, he publishes the Jewish state, Der Judenstaat, in 1896. And he writes here, the Jewish question persists wherever Jews live in appreciable numbers. Wherever it does not exist, it is brought together with Jewish immigrants. We are naturally drawn into those places where we are not persecuted and our appearance there gives rise to persecution. So basically, you know, European Jews, they see an area in Europe where they're not being actively persecuted. So they go there. And then as a result of the increase in the Jewish population, then they're persecuted. This is the case and will inevitably be so everywhere, even in highly civilized countries. See, for instance, France. Now, this is what he's noting here. See, for instance, France. Look at what is going on in France right now um, with this, uh, you know, with this huge debate here about, uh, you know, about Dreyfus. OK, so he's saying here, like you look at what's going on in France so long as the Jewish question is not solved on the political level. And so basically, as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, that the Dreyfus affair and this, uh, you know, all everything that goes along with that, you know, it did prompt many European Jews to give up on their efforts. OK, so to integrate into European society. And of course, uh, today, about 90 percent of the world's Jews are divided between the United States and uh, Israel, you know, that there are by proportion very few Jews that live in Europe, whereas at the turn of the 20th century, 90 percent of the world's Jews lived in Europe. So we want to understand, you know, how Zionism 
fits into this overall nationalistic mindset that this is a form of Jewish nationalism. And so with that, uh, yeah, so we've got uh, we've got here um, Zionism got its name because Zion is like one of the words that's used to uh, to refer to the kingdom of Israel. And that's, of course, why Theodore Herzl um, is thinking in terms of where should this Jewish state be located? OK, and he says, well, the, this Jewish state should be located um, in what was then, uh, you know, no, what had then become known as Palestine, which had been the ancient, you know, Judea, where the Jewish state had been, uh, you know, in, you know, ancient history. So as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, I took you all on a bit of a, uh, you know, a bit of a ride there, you know, going from important people. But I think, you know, Theodore Herzl is definitely somebody I would throw in there as the father of Zionism. And so how did nationalism gain so much traction in terms of influencing the powers of Europe? Now, Ella, one of the things that we want to note, OK, we want to note how the Crimean War, OK, um, at that uh, at that time um, is, you know, when we look at the Crimean War at that time, um, that is happening, you know, in the 1850s, that the Crimean War is basically the end of the concert of Europe, okay? And remember that the concert of Europe, part of that was about containing nationalist movements, okay? So when we look at the Crimean War, we're looking for that. The Crimean War demonstrated the weakness of the Ottoman Empire and contributed to the breakdown of the concert of Europe. So what we want to understand here, so thereby creating the conditions in which Italy and Germany could be unified after centuries of fragmentation. So one thing when the concert of Europe breaks down, one of the things that you see here is that the concert of Europe was part of what was keeping nationalism contained. So at the end of that, that, that's what we're seeing, uh, what we're seeing here. So going from there, um, you know, when we look here at the, uh, you know, at the concert of Europe and its breakdown, uh, you know, nationalism had really, I mean, it's kind of, you know, I mean, you look back at the French Revolution. The French Revolution is where you begin you know, seeing clear signs of nationalism. So going from there, though, when we look uh, when we look here, fitched, fitched, whatever, you know, it's a written or type test, whatever it is, some German guy. Um, this is in uh, 1808. OK, so as far as that goes in 1808, Napoleon, uh, you know, his victories in Europe, he ended up abolishing the Holy Roman Empire. And so with that, What's going to be set up in its place? Now you have the German Confederation is set up, okay, which uh, which Napoleon set up the Confederation of the Rhine, which then the Congress of Vienna set up the German Confederation. And so the thing is here, though, that what's going to happen now, okay? So what you start to see is the French Revolution is where we start to see some clear signs of modern nationalism. Um, this idea that remember sovereignty resides in the nation. And Napoleon, one of the things that Napoleon is doing here, which actually I did put this up on my, on my website, I'm just gonna go ahead and direct y'all to it. Did Napoleon um, betray the French Revolution? So this is something now I've actually uh, I've actually got this here. Um, I've actually got this here now. OK, so uh, so Napoleon, let's see, French Revolution it's not coming up yet as a post yet. But if you go to the actual blog post, let's see here. So I'm going to go ahead and put that there. And so you all can go ahead if you want to. You can download the handout. OK, so, yeah, when you Google that feeling, when you Google yourself. Right. So looking at this, uh, you know, as far as that goes, I've got this here in online format. But then I've also got this uh, in a format of, uh, you know, like a PDF format. So you can click here to download a printable PDF where when you're looking at Napoleon, you know, in the values of the French Revolution, one of 
the things about Napoleon, notice this is like the longest, uh, the longest part of this where I'm getting into how Napoleon was a champion of French nationalism. Okay. That nationalism is really one of Napoleon's biggest things. So bringing back the Catholic church, for example, that is the majority religion. Napoleon is bringing back the Catholic church, um, you know, in the sense that this is, you know, not that Napoleon was like any kind of sincere or committed Catholic himself personally, but it's something here that, you know, Napoleon believes that this is the national religion. OK, this is the national religion. So, you know, that's part of that. Now, also Napoleon, uh, you know, he uses that tricolor flag, which represents the nation on um, this, uh, you know, that had been adopted under the French Republic. And so with that, you know, going from here, we see that, uh, you know, we'll just call him Fitched, uh, you know, here. I don't know how to say his name. I'm not going to pretend to. Um, where he says the first original and truly natural boundaries of states are beyond, okay, so are beyond doubt their internal boundaries. Those who speak the same language are joined to each other by a multitude of invisible bonds by nature herself. Now, of course, we can understand that here, that in order for you to, uh, to be here right now, you may not speak English as your first language, but you clearly understand English as a, you know, as a spoken language enough that you can be educated by it, you know? So to be here, you can't like really just like, okay, I can kind of get what you're saying, but you have to really be in a situation where you can understand and express yourself in English. AP exams, answers to AP exams have to be written in English. And so you see here that language joins people by invisible bonds. We can understand each other. And that's the thing that, you know, when you're talking to somebody who isn't fluent in a language, you know, where, and even somebody who is from a foreign country, but they're fluent, sometimes you find yourself having to explain figures of speech and stuff like that. And so this, you know, he says that you can understand each other more clearly. And so there's this nationalist movement and part of that, that's part of what's leading to that, that led to the French revolution. It's part of what is going to lead to the revolutions of 1848. And so as this continues, you see this tendency to unify in Germany and in Italy. Now, of course, Bismarck kind of hijacks this. Bismarck's more of a conservative than anything, but at the end of the day, he's a Machiavellian, uh, that Bismarck ends up, uh, you know, basically unifying Germany, but under Prussian dominance and excluding Austria. Um, because that would, you know, that would make it to where Prussia is not obviously in control. So nationalism is definitely going to be manipulated at times. Now, we also want to note here is, uh, you know, Austria, Hungary, uh, you know, map. When we look at Germany and Italy, we had people who were separated by who spoke the same language, but were separated by political boundaries. Uh, now, of course, in Italy as well, um, you have mostly, you know, that they practice the same religion. Um, but what's going on here when you look at Austria-Hungary, now, of course, they made after the revolutions of 1848, uh, you know, a little bit after that, not immediately after, but this is a period where, uh, you know, Hungary gets some autonomy. The Hungarians, who, co who constituted a major ethnic group in, uh, in the Austrian Empire, it begins to be known as Austria-Hungary, that it is a dual monarchy at that time. Now, this is right after Austria loses the Austro-Prussian War. And so right after Austria loses the Austro-Prussian War, in a moment of weakness, you know, they see that, you know, Hungary, now in 1848, they put down the Hungarian Revolt. But at the same time, what happens here is although Hungary gets some autonomy and gets their own monarch there, you have no less than 10 different ethnic 
ethnic groups, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And we've got here Croats and Serbians who are of different language groups, different religions. Um, then, of course, it doesn't mention the Bosnians. So really, you've got more than 10 different ethnic groups um, in the Austria, you know, in Austria, Hungary, the Austrian Empire, whatever you want to call it. Um, but with this, what's going to happen here? And of course, this is where World War One is going to start. Um, when we talk about the causes of World War One, which we'll get into a little bit more next week, uh, you know, when we stop, talk about imperialism, uh, you know, when we talk about nationalism, we think about this, but also I like to note that imperialism is not just beyond Europe, that when you look at the German Empire, the Russian Empire, and the Austrian Empire, and the Ottoman Empire, these are all empires within Europe, okay? So before World War I, you know, Europe was home to at least four different empires right there on the European continent. And when you look at this, uh, you know, at this imperialism, this idea that we'll continue to hold on to this empire while there are nationalist movements, that is part of what's going to be leading to World War I. And so with that, um, yeah. Why did Henry VIII marry his dead brother's wife? Isn't that the question that we all want to know, right? Um, yes. Um, you know, as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, Joey, um, y'all look out for an email. I'm going to be sending out an email, um, you know, about a DBQ walkthrough. Okay. Either this Saturday or next Saturday, that'll be a premium session, uh, where I'm going to go over like a DBQ walkthrough. I'm going to be focusing on content. Uh, this evening. Okay. So with that, uh, you know, mass politics. Okay. So what you want to know about mass politics, uh, this is what's basically going on in the late 19th century. Uh, for the first time, we're seeing universal male suffrage is becoming the norm in Europe. So, you know, even in the early 19th century in Britain, I've got a, you know, series on reform in Britain and the Reform Act of 1830. Two, um, only really extends the franchise to about one in six men in Britain that you still had to have a certain amount of proper a certain amount of property in order to vote. Now, it becomes the norm across Europe in the late 19th century to have at least one house of the legislature elected by universal male suffrage. Okay, that's what's going to happen there. And of course, that has an effect on mass politics because everybody can vote regardless of property. It's going to be something that is going to make liberalism have to evolve a bit from the classical liberalism of Gladstone um, to the more pragmatic like liberalism of Lloyd George, um, that it's actually conservative parties are going to become the economically liberal parties um, in a lot of cases. So mass politics, you also have the beginning of labor parties, okay? Now labor parties, um, these are parties that are appealing to workers and they typically have like, so the labor party in Britain, the social democratic party, Party, the one that Bismarck banned, uh, these are parties that are appealing to laborers and they typically have a socialist agenda, but they want to implement that socialist agenda through the political process, okay? They want to implement the socialist agenda through the political process rather than uh, you know, rather than through a violent revolution. So that's going to be something that is uh, that is important there. Um, so then somebody was asking something about the opium wars. OK, the Chinese, that's basically I think there. Yeah, the Chinese got smashed in the opium war. So, you know, basically China did not want to trade goods for goods. The Chinese, they're like, we don't want your European goods. Now, if Europeans want Chinese goods, pay for them in silver. So the British paid for the Chinese goods in silver, and then they would grow opium in India and they would sell it uh, to, they would sell it in China. They'd get their silver back. So China's like, okay, we're going to go to war. And Britain's like, okay, we're kind of the biggest empire in the world. And so you've got the opium wars between China and Japan. Now, I mean, no, not China and Japan, sorry, China and Britain. And Britain, like pretty much just, uh, yeah, I mean, Britain wins the opium wars pretty convincingly. That's one of the reasons that the British, uh, you know, ruled Hong Kong for so long. 
And so as far as that goes, the British won the Opium Wars. Now at the same time, the Japanese, we want to note that the Japanese, uh, they westernize, okay? They see the writing on the wall and they westernize and they adopt a modern Navy. They adopt a Western army. Um, it's really kind of the whole Peter the Great phenomenon happening in Japan. And speaking of Peter the Great, uh, what ends up happening uh, in the Russo-Japanese War, okay? The Russo-Japanese War um, is... Um, you know, a war that is, uh, you know, it is the first time that a non-European power defeats a European power. OK, so Russia has a humiliating defeat there. And that is about the same time as the Russian Revolution of 1905. Now, with that, let me go ahead and answer a question here. Now, I'm going to let you know that I have a video on this, okay? I have a video on this topic that I think will be very useful to you, Ella, and the 13 people who upvoted, okay? So, um, she's asking, what's the difference between the first Industrial Revolution and the second Industrial Revolution? I have a video titled the second industrial revolution. I'll give y'all a second if you want to, you know, use your snipping tool or whatever to take a screenshot or something like that, that I've got this graphic organizer that is comparing the first industrial revolution and the second industrial revolution. Now, again, you can go to my YouTube video. I explain this, you know, where it's like, okay, this revolution from about 1760 to 1830, from hand power to machine power, then 1850 to 1914. The second industrial revolution is basically the Crystal Palace to World War I. And the big thing here is the first industrial revolution is about the mass production of te textiles. Second industrial revolution is about the mass production of steel, the Bessemer process. Now, remember, before the industrial revolution, textiles were produced. It was just difficult to produce them in mass. Before the second industrial revolution, steel was produced. It was just hard to produce steel in mass. And so with that, we also see the second industrial revolution. Some of these technologies look familiar. Petroleum and electricity, that's how we, uh, that's what we still run on, on to, a, to a great extent. Also the internal combustion engine, that is the engine that is in your car more than likely, an internal combustion engine. And so with that, unless you got some kind of newfangled car, I don't really know about, okay? So that's first industrial revolution, second industrial revolution, and I've got a video um, where I've got that. So just uh, just understand there, okay? And I tell you what, uh, Jess, uh, we got a pog in the chat here, right? I mean, that, uh, you know, we, I mean, I guess, uh, yeah, Jess is, uh, Pog in the chat. All right. So, uh, so going, uh, going there. Now, another thing I would say is that the second industrial revolution is amazing contextualization for German unification, the new imperialism, World War One, just about any topic that you could see here, the second industrial revolution, because it puts a greater gap between in developed countries and developing countries, industrialized countries, non-industrialized countries. So the Franco-Prussian War, for example, you know, Germany, uh, Bismarck had championed a very aggressive industrialization campaign. Um, and then meanwhile, France really had not. France just kind of took their time, okay? Which uh, France, this is a country where, you know, you can spend like two hours eating lunch at a cafe and just talking to strangers, um, I guess back when, you know, you could still go to France and that sort of thing. So with that, the second industrial revolution to me makes great contextualization because it's sitting in the background, you know, Austro-Prussian War, Franco-Prussian War, new imperialism, World War One, the second industrial revolution. All right. So as far as that, uh, you know, as far as that goes, it's an AP Euro party. All right. So with this, the Crimean War, I think I've kind of hinted at the Crimean War a number of times, okay, that the Crimean War is caused, first of all, by the continuing weakness of the Ottoman Empire. Remember, the sick man of Europe. Russia decides, you know what, we're going to take advantage of this weakness. We're going to move in. 
all right? And Britain and France are like, balance of power, no, you're not, okay? So Britain and France come in here and they go to war with Russia. They side with, uh, with the Ottoman Empire because they feel that Russia is taking advantage of the situation and trying to swing the balance of power their way. And they're like, nope. And so one thing that we note here is the Crimean War, first of all, again, is kind of the death knell of the concert system because we've got great powers fighting each other. Now, it's not a proper continental war. That's another thing I'll note about this. The Crimean War, I wouldn't refer to this as like a continental war, um, that you don't really have a true continental war, like, you know, a million people dead plus um, between the Napoleonic Wars and World War I. So that's another thing to note. Now, another thing about the Crimean War is it was a modernizing war, okay, that basically the British, because of the Crimean War, um, they stopped selling commissions. Uh, how many of y'all have heard the poem, The Charge of the Light Brigade? Okay, um, so let me note here, um, you know, Charge of the Light Brigade, okay, um, you know, Charge of the Light Brigade, and I've heard it and never heard of it, okay? Um, so that might be a good, uh, that might be a good thing to do at the end. Let's see, we've got a poll out there. How many of y'all, let's see what we've got here. How many of y'all have never heard of the Charge of the Light Brigade? Okay, so Alfred Lord Tennyson uh, wrote uh, the Charge of the Light Brigade. And this was from a battle, okay? So when we look at, I've got here, the Charge of the Light Brigade was a failed military action, okay? So the Charge of the Light Brigade, well, also most of y'all have never heard of it, okay? So let's go ahead and, uh, you know, we'll do that. Uh, we'll do this as kind of our last sort of thing here. So it was a failed charge of British light cavalry at the Battle of Balaclava in 1854. Now note here that this is basically they're sending light cavalry at a position that has got heavy guns. Okay, so it's like they're basically they're sending cavalry, light cavalry on horseback here and not only do we have guns here but we also have guns here okay so basically as the cavalry are coming in they're being you know they've got guns all over the place aimed at them and they get pretty much obliterated okay and so alfred lord tennyson it's kind of you know it was a very stupid thing that happened um but note here lord cardigan lord raglan OK, these are all of these lords. And what happens here is as a result of the Crimean War, uh, this is uh, this is something that it is mo like the British military is modernized, like they end the practice of buying your commission. Like basically, if someone wanted a certain commission, in the British military, it was kind of like what you had in the Catholic Church at the time of the Reformation, that you want this, uh, you want this commission, you got to pay for it. And it made sure that, you know, the upper classes um, held a corner on military offices. But at the same time, you know, so you got about six, uh, 670 with 110 killed, another 161 wounded. So only, you know, nearly half of the people sent into that charge um, came out in, uh, you know, came out not dead, not wounded, basically ready to go into action again. So the British, like, basically go into a meritocracy. Um, and there's one film that I, you know, often show clips of, uh, you know, we're talking about imperialism, a film called Zulu, um, which is, uh, you know, a movie about the Battle of Rourke's Drift. And you can see these two officers that one of them comes from obviously a traditional like upper class British military family. And another one is from a more middle class background. And so you see this, uh, you know, the snobbery of the upper class guy, uh, you know, and the more like pragmatic kind of, uh, you know, kind of take that this, uh, you know, that the middle class guy has. So with that, let's go ahead and close with the Charge of the Light Brigade by Alfred Lord Tennyson. Half a league, half a league, half a league onward. All in the Valley of Death rode the 600. Forward the Light Brigade, charge for the guns, he say. Into the Valley of Death rode the 600. Forward the Light Brigade, was there a man dismayed? Not though the soldier knew, someone had blundered. Theirs not to make reply, theirs not to reason why, theirs but to do and die. Into the valley of death rode the 600. Cannon to the right of them, cannon to the left of them, cannon in front of them volleyed and thundered. 
stormed out with shot and shell. Boldly they rode and well into the jaws of death, into the mouth of hell, rode the 600. Flashed all their sabers bare, flashed as they turned in air, sabering the gunners there, charging an army, while all the world wondered. Plunged in the battery smoke, right through the line they broke, Cossack and Russian reeled from the saber stroke, shattered and sundered. Then they rode back, but not, not the 600. Cannon to the right of them, cannon to the left of them, cannon behind them, volleyed and thundered, stormed out with shot and shell, while horse and hero fell. They that had fought so well came through the jaws of death, back from the mouth of hell. All that was left of them, left of 600. When can their glory fade? Oh, the wild charge they made. All the world wondered. Honor the charge they made. Honor the Light Brigade, Noble 600. Now, that is a great example of romantic poetry, okay? So as far as that goes, thank y'all. Y'all enjoyed the dramatic reading, okay? But this is romantic poetry, right? That he is romanticizing something that happened that was really like a, okay, okay <laughs> great, glad, glad you like that. Um, so I'll have to put that into my routine. But basically you understand how Lord Tennyson is romanticizing this, but from a command perspective, this was stupid, you know, where he says someone had blundered. Basically, you've got these, uh, you know, these upper class idiots that are running everything. And that's why this happened. So with that, uh, you know, it was something that was dumb, but the bravery of these men deserve to be commended. And that is a very romantic um, kind of way of looking at this. So very glad that y'all got uh, got to see a little bit here. So with this, uh, with this, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you know, some lives are complete here. I will be here again next time. We'll be, uh, you know, focusing on, you know, Unit 8, which is, of course, um, you know, 20th century global conflicts, World War One, and the like. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we will uh, go ahead and end this session and I will see y'all next week. Now, look for an email from me because either this Saturday or next Saturday, I just need to look at my calendar. I'm planning on doing a premium session where I'm going to do a DBQ walkthrough on World War One, okay, on the causes of World War One. So stay tuned for that. All right. So ladies and gentlemen, it is always a pleasure.